Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm an alcoholic. Um, Sam Reed, lovely. The lovely Sam Reed just made me really nervous, so thank, thank you. Um, my home group is uh, Solution on the Shore. We meet 8 o'clock Saturday nights in Neptune, New Jersey. It is the best home group in Jersey. I absolutely love it. We have like 150 people there every week. There's a lot of energy. We're really active. We go to rehabs and detoxes and other A groups in the area because in Jersey they do this thing. Um, it's called Booker's. And all the home groups, all the speaker meetings meet in a parking lot. And um, you just go up to a complete stranger. You're like, hey, you want to speak at my group? And they're like, sure, we'll come speak at yours. And uh, if you go into these speaker meetings, like, you do not know what you're going to hear. And sometimes you hear the craziest stuff, which, you know, I, I came around Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard this crazy stuff and I was not impressed. And I had no <laughs> intention of coming back. Um, people were talking about their cats and uh, how they hated their wives and... I was just like, I, like, want to kill myself, and you're talking about your cat? Like, I don't, it wasn't impressed. Um, I have a sponsor, and I have the privilege and honor in sponsoring others, and my sobriety date is February 2nd, 2010. Um, I grew up in a really normal family. Uh, my dad's an alcoholic. He hasn't picked up a drink in 25 years doesn't really attend AA or do any of that stuff, you know, he white knuckles it, and he does, like, church and stuff, so he's a pretty happy guy, um, but I've never seen him pick up a drink, and there's no alcohol in my house ever growing up, my mom would drink at family parties, and I didn't know anything about alcohol, and I really don't remember anything about my childhood, we were talking about it on the way up, and Patty's like, of course you don't remember uh, your childhood. You were so consumed with self. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you're right. But me and my dad got along really well, um, more than me and my mom ever. We didn't get along. But me and my dad were, like, exactly the same person. We could sit there and joke around and talk for hours. Um, we're just, like, I loved him. We were great. Um, and when I was, like, seven years old, I remember him telling me, like, Ashley, you were definitely an alcoholic. And you're never going to successfully pick up a drink. Um, and, like, I had no idea what he's talking about because I was seven years old and I haven't seen alcohol yet. Like, I had no idea what he's talking about. But um, the first thing I do remember is when I was 12 years old, we moved from one town to the next. And they were literally next to each other. And I absolutely thought my world was over. I was 12 years old. I looked really awkward. Um, you know, wasn't too happy about the situation, and I really thought my parents were just trying to absolutely ruin my life. You know, I thought they were doing anything they could to just destroy me. Um, and that absolutely wasn't the case. It was a better school system. It was a more affordable house, and my parents just did everything they could in their power with what they had to give me the best life they possibly could. And I looked at them like, these, you know, these people are trying to ruin my life. They hate everything about me, and they want to see me cry and have no friends and suffer. Um, so I walked around that school, and I was so afraid, and I was, like, crippled with fear. I'd be in, like, the back of the room, like, shaking uncontrollably. So I didn't make a lot of friends that way. Um, and it was, it was really sad, and it was really lonely. Um, but I had a couple friends, you know, like, the nerdy girls, like, felt bad for me, but I really didn't want anything. You know, I just wanted to be a part of. I wanted to have friends. I wanted to be popular. I wanted people to like me, you know, because I didn't like myself. I had no idea who I was. And um, the next year in that school, I found out, like, if I lie to these girls and I just tell them, like, anything they want to hear, um, whatever they're doing, if I say I'm going to do it, like, I can impress them and they'll like me, and it worked. So I tricked all these really popular girls into liking me, like, whatever music they listen to. I've seen them twice in concert with my older brother. Uh, whatever stores they shopped at, I've been shopping there since I was eight. My closet's full of it at home. I just don't have it on right now, you know. Just anything I could tell them to make them like me, and it worked. And um, as the year went on, like, they started talking about, like, partying, going out with boys and drinking, and I definitely wasn't doing any of that. I, like, really looked awkward. Um, guys were not looking my direction whatsoever. 
But I told them, like, yeah, I, I drink with my older cousins and my brother, and, like, we do Jaeger bombs at, at college, at, at um, weddings and stuff. So I'm, I'm really cool, guys. Like, you should like me. Um, just anything I could tell these girls, you know. I just really, really wanted them to like me. And um, for whatever reason, I guess we had a family party at my house because there was never alcohol. Like, my mom kept it out of the house, like, to protect my dad, who's 25 years sober. Um, for whatever reason, there's this big bottle of Kettle One Vodka, and I would stalk it, you know. Like, I knew it was there. I knew its exact location and how much was in it, and I could not wait to get my hands on it at the right opportunity, and the right opportunity came, and I poured a big glass of it, and I invited these girls over. I was like, I'm really, really going to impress them now. Like, they are really going to be impressed when they see this. So I got this big glass, and I grabbed the orange juice, and I invited these girls over, and um, they were like, wow, like, you really are cool. And I was like, I know. I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we drank, and I absolutely fell in love with alcohol the way it made me feel. I didn't have to lie to these girls anymore, you know. I um, I just was me, you know. I didn't care what you thought of me. I didn't care what I had to say for you to like me because I finally felt one with myself. I finally felt okay. And that's all I ever wanted. I just wanted to wake up in the morning and just look in the mirror and be okay. It's all I ever strive for. Um, and I found that in alcohol. And it was really hard for, like, a 13, 14-year-old girl who lives in, like, suburbia, um, whose parents don't drink to get their hands on alcohol. So I went to great lengths after that day to get my hands on alcohol. And when I did, I drank as much as I possibly could because um, I didn't know when the opportunity was going to happen. And when I start drinking, I cannot stop. And when I stop, all I do is think about it, like, how am I going to get more? Like, I cannot wait to do this again. I need to do this every single day of my life. And pretty quickly, I started to get in a lot of trouble. Um, the police in my town weren't impressed when I would, like, drink out of control and black out and run around taking my clothes off. They really didn't like it, so the police started taking me home, and I started absolutely killing my parents. You know, they worked so hard to give me a good life. And my dad's alcoholic, and he knows that, like, I'm going to have issues with it. He just knew from the get-go. And um, he doesn't want to see me destroy my life, and he doesn't want to see me go down the same path he went down. But I didn't care at all, and I started getting in all sorts of trouble, and um, they sent me to the juvenile courts, and I have to do all these ridiculous things, and those popular girls really don't want me around anymore, because, like, if Ashley's around, the police are going to show up, so, like, let's avoid her at all costs. Um, and I just, throughout high school, I just went from group of friend to group of friend, um, if you had what I wanted, I would just step on your toes and walk all over you, take what I needed until you couldn't stand to have me around and go on to the next group who was doing the next thing. And um, I heard a lot of people, and I stepped on a lot of toes, and I didn't care. And I start getting all these crazy consequences. Um, they're sending me to the Scared Straight program, and I'm on this, like, kitty version of probation for, like, whatever arrest it was, and uh, I violate it because the police picked me up again. So they sent me to, like, Clinton State Prison, which is, like, the women's prison in New Jersey for 24 hours. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm from a really suburban town, and they send me, like, in this bus with, like, actual, like, 16-year-old criminals. Like, they were, like, literally, like, armed robberies and stuff. <laughs> and um, they sent me to this prison for 24 hours, and I absolutely loved it. I had a great time there. <laughs> You know, like, we had to wear the prison garments and everything and eat the food, but, like, it wasn't, like, bad. Like, we just, like, hung out with the inmates. They told us their stories. We told them theirs. And I really, like, no consequence was great enough for me to ever be, like, I need to stop drinking or I really need to get my life together or I really need to stop breaking my parents' heart day in and day out when I walk in the door and I'm completely wrecked or I just go out and I don't come home for two days and they have no idea where I am. None of that ever fazed me. None of that was enough because um, it, it worked, you know. It was what, I, what worked for me. And so I toured through high school and I toured through all these friendships. And I'm just, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a bad person, you know. No one really <laughs> wants me around. And by the end, by my senior year, I'm, like, completely out of control. My parents were like, maybe this, like, grounding her and punishing her thing isn't working, so let's save up all our money and buy her a car. 
This way she'll she'll have like responsibility and she won't want to drink, you know? She'll she'll grow up. So they buy me this car and I start drinking and driving all over the place. <laughs> and um it's summertime and I, I live in a beach town and I lifeguard and I think I'm on top of the world. Um I don't think anything can stop me ever and I got myself into a lot of bad, scary situations. This one night where I'm out drinking and um I had, like, a couple drinks before we went out, and I'm, like, on the tier of blacking out, and we're at this party. I just remember, like, a couple things. I remember there was a bonfire. Two people were fighting, um, and I really need to get in the middle of it, and I have to break this fight up. <laughs> so what I decided, it was between a boy and a girl, like, yelling back and forth at each other, and I was like, this boy really needs to get punched in the face. So I went and I like swung to punch him in the face. The only thing was he was on the other side of the bonfire. And I fell and I passed out and I had third degree burns all up and down my arms. Um, don't remember a thing. Don't remember how I got home. Woke up, or I don't remember waking up. I came to the next day on the lifeguard stand, looked at my arm because it was in an immense amount of pain. Um, and I was like, what time is it? You know, so the dude sitting next to me, he's like, it's 10. I was like, how, what time did I get here? He was like, 8.30. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, you know, and that's just, like, that's just an example of the stuff I would do. Like, I had absolutely no concept of responsibility or, like, accountability to anyone or anything. I just did what I wanted and had no control over it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so it's senior year now, and I'm, I have this car, and I'm driving around, and nothing can stop me. And my parents are just like, whatever you do, just don't drink and drive. Like, it's cool. Like, obviously, we're not going to stop you from drinking anymore. Like, you drink around the clock. Just don't get behind the wheel of that car. I was like, oh, sure, absolutely. Um, and I, I re honestly tried not to drink and drive. Um, but this one night, someone called me, and they're like, I need a ride. I was like, oh, I'm coming, you know? So I hop in the car, and I go and I, to pick this girl up, and, like, Two minutes away from my house, I get pulled over and I get arrested for a DUI. And my blood alcohol content was about like a one four. Um, and my parents had, you know, my dad, like he always did, came down to the police station, bailed me out, um, and he was so devastated. He's like, the only thing I ever asked of you was just not to get behind the wheel of that car. We sa we saved for years to get you that car. We worked so hard, you know. We trusted you with a little thing. Like, what are you doing with your life? And, I was, you know, I felt bad, but I was like, I might as well just drink because, like, I don't want to cry. So I went out the very next night, and I drank again, and I just absolutely murdered my parents. Just stepped all over their hearts day in and day out and just didn't care. And I, they dropped me off at, like, the hospital because they'd be all mad. And they're like, we're calling the cops. So I was like, oh, I'm going to kill myself. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> they dropped me off to the hospital and all this stuff. And this process just went on and on and on. It was never ending. It was chaotic, but I didn't care. Um, the first thing I did care about is exactly seven days after I was arrested for my DUI, uh, I was out at a party, like always, and uh, this kid, Johnny, who was one of my really good friends in high school, great kid, had like a scholarship to go to college, awesome family, everybody's friend, always had a smile from ear to ear. We're at this party, and he just jumped in the car to drive around the block, and um, he pulled out of the driveway. A car was coming, and he died in a drunk driving car accident. Um, and, you know, my childhood, like, my dad is a religious person. We, he, he attended church. I had this concept of God. We were active in this church and everything. And then when I started my chaotic mess, like, we kind of drifted away because my parents were just completely embarrassed by me. Um, they didn't really want to be seen with me in public. Um, <laughs> you know, and I remember when that happened, when Johnny passed away, I was so angry at God for taking someone like Johnny, who was such a good kid, and not someone like me, seven days ago, who, like, just walks all over people, who has no respect for anyone, who, like, no one really even likes me. You know, I was so angry at God. So I stopped drinking for about a month, um, just out of, like, sadness and fear. And 
that month went by, and I'm sitting around with some friends. I'm like, you know, I don't think Johnny would want us to sit around and feel sorry for him. I think he'd, like, want us to go out and, like, celebrate his life. So we did. Um, <laughs> and then I started drinking around the clock, and I'm going out on a Friday night. I'm not coming home till like, Sunday night, maybe Monday morning before school. And I'm um, waking up places, and I don't remember how I got there around people that I didn't even know I was friends with. Um, and it was just a disaster. And no one wanted me around. All my friends, or people I thought were my friends, just because I wanted some friends, they're all sitting me down like, Ashley, you have a serious problem, and you seriously need to do something about it. And I was like, you guys are crazy. Like, this is the only thing that's ever worked in my life. Like, I feel miserable when I'm not drinking. Why wouldn't I drink? It's the only way out. And they're like, yeah, that's a problem. Um, but I didn't see it that way, and I uh, continue to drink, and it's my senior year, so you guys know how senior year is. It's like supposed to be like the time of your life, so we're drinking night and day. Um, I can barely get to school without having something in my system to get through the day, and I, I just think it's a big party. I don't really care. And the end of my senior year, like I said, I'm drinking around the clock, and I've been arrested like 12 times from like 14 to 18, so the school police officer knows me pretty well. We're pretty much on a first-name basis at this point. Um, and he likes to, like, follow me around and, like, check in, see what I'm doing. And this one day, he comes up to me, and he's like, Ashley, I'm not going to watch you kill yourself anymore. You know, it's, it's just a crime if I let this go on any longer. So he took me by the hand, and he dragged me in front of the school, and he arrested me uh, right as everyone was coming and going. The entire school saw it. I was so filled with, like, this shame and this guilt. And, like, I finally got to a point with my parents, like, they didn't really care what I did. They just kind of pretended I didn't exist. And I was so ashamed that, like, my dad's going to have to come and, like, bail me out of this one again. You know, like, I had managed to stay out of trouble for, like, a couple months, which was a big thing for me. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do or how I was going to get out of it or explain it. I couldn't think of any lies to tell them anymore about why this one happened. So they take me down to the processing center and they do the whole processing. And all the police that have arrested me um, over the years are like stopping in to say hello. Um, <laughs> it's so embarrassing. And I got they, got, they showed me all my mug shots and everything <laughs> through the past years. They were not cute. Um, and they have me, like, double cuffed to the benches because I'm, like, you know, I'm, like, really dangerous. <laughs> and uh, they're, like, all right, we're going to call your dad so he can come get you. And I was, like, all right, you know. I'm, like, sobered up at this point. And I can hear my dad's voice, but I can't see him. And I hear the school police officer. He's, like, oh, Mr. Harmer, we'll go get Ashley for you. And, uh. He's like, no, I don't want her. Like, you guys deal with her. I'm done. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? I was like, I don't, you know, no one is going to come pick me up. Like, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? So they let me sit there for, like, 15 minutes, and I, I couldn't even cry. I couldn't even feel anything. I just felt so empty at that point. And the school police officer comes into my little holding cell, and he's, He's like, we don't want you either, so I'll give you a ride home. And I was like, all right. Like, I, I was like, can I sit in the front at least? And he's like, no. Um, so he gives me a ride home, and I walk into my parents' house, and I can hear my mom crying, and it's echoing through the house. I've never heard anyone cry that loud my entire life. It's honestly echoing. And my dad's sitting in the living room, so I walk in, and I look over at him, and he just looked right through me. Um, like a terrorist just walked into his house. I cannot describe that look. I hope I never have to see it ever again my whole life. Um, and he just looked at me and said, what are you going to do with yourself? You're 18 years old and you have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. And we want absolutely nothing to do with you if you don't make some changes. And uh, they were trying to get me into, like, some rehabs. And I'm in this IOP program at this point. And I just don't even know what to do. I don't know what to feel. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. And I had this friend um, 
who went to rehab about a month before everything happened, and uh, she was going to AA meetings, and she would tell me about it, and I was like, that sucks. That really sounds like the end of the world. Um, <laughs> so she really didn't appreciate me too much. And I was like, Dad, I'm going to go to AA, um, and that, you know, problem will be solved. He was like, I, I hope you do something. I don't really care. So I called this girl, and I was like, can you please take me to an AA meeting? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. I was like, you're way too excited about this. Like, <laughs> I'm really not excited. And uh, she picked me up, and we went to this meeting. And it was a big meeting, um, a lot of old dudes, uh, a lot of them. And I walked in, and I had been to an AA meeting before, um, one, so I knew everything about it, you know. Um, <laughs> And I was like, here we go again, a bunch of old dudes. I bet they're going to complain about their problems. Uh, but it was a speaker meeting, and it was the end of the month, so it was a celebration. And this little old lady, she was, like, so old. She was, like, 150 years old. She got up behind the podium, and she was, like, she was celebrating, I don't know, 100 years. And um, she... She, was, she talked about what it was like right before she stopped drinking, and she talked about that loneliness that I was feeling at that exact moment, and that emptiness, and that just aloneness, and so scared. And she said she felt like dying. I was like, I feel like dying too. Um, so I got this like little glimpse of hope from that meeting, and uh, me and this girl and another girl ran around AA for about for a while, and um, she would relapse every 90 days. Um, <laughs> She was a disaster to hang out with, but I had no other choice, you know. Um, I had nowhere else to go, and the alternative wasn't much better. Um, so we're running around AA, and we're going to all these crazy meetings, and there's this, um, like, dingy clubhouse in Belmar. <laughs> and uh, I'm in there, like, all the time, and I'm raising my hand and telling them all about my problems, because I, I thought that's what you were supposed to do. That's what everyone else was doing. And I heard the suggestions, like, get a sponsor and do the steps, and I was like, that sounds like so dumb, I'm definitely not going to do that, and we're going to all these different meetings, and we're running around like crazy, and uh, stuff on the outside got really good, uh, I got the car back, I got, a, I was licensed, my parents like looked at me, and we had conversations, I remembered getting to work and leaving work, um, <laughs> I had money in my pocket. It was great, you know, and I felt like absolute crap. I hated every minute of my life. I felt the exact same way as I did that day pretty much the entire six months, and it was unbearable. I just felt so empty and alone, and I couldn't bear it another minute. I couldn't believe these people are running around Alcoholics Anonymous feeling the way I feel. I'm like, don't you guys know that, like, if you drink, like, it's not that bad. Um, you just got to, like, be smart and not get in trouble. Like, where's that Where's that option? You know, that's, that's what I went to Alcoholics Anonymous for, like, to find the right way, like, the right combination to not get arrested, to not break my father's heart, you know, to make the police, like, stay off my back. Um, by the end of that six months, I was just so drained, and I couldn't stand it another minute. And I was a mess. I'm spending all my money on clothes. I'm, like, not acting like a sober woman whatsoever, and I have absolutely no solution. I just thought if I stop drinking, I'll be okay, and I absolutely was not okay. Um, so I couldn't stand it another second, and I told that girl I ran around with, I was like, if, if things get bad, I can just come back, you know? Like, I, this is pretty bad. I don't even want to be here. And she was like, all right, sounds good. So I called up some old friends, and I told them, you know, when you get six months in AA, you can either um, choose to stay in AA or they tell you how to drink successfully. They, they tell you the secret. So I know the secret, so, like, let's go out. Um, and they bought it for some reason. And um, I went out one night. I went down to a college, um, and my friends quickly found out that I was lying. <laughs> and, you know, and it just started all over again. And... I was waking up places that I didn't know how I got there. I'm walking all over people, and I'm just taking whatever I can get out of the situation. Um, you know, and it, it was just, you know, it was the same exact thing I've always done. And uh, it was lonely. Like, most of the time, I just wanted to drink by myself because I couldn't even stand anyone else around me. 
it was really dark, and it was just really, like, it was just bad. Like, I wasn't getting that relief I once did. There was no, nothing glamorous about it. There was nothing fun about it. I didn't want to stay doing that, but I couldn't bear going back to AA. And at the end of that six months, I ran into some people um, who were having a different experience than I was. They had, like, this weird speaker meeting, um, and they were, like, really happy, and they were really excited, and they always talked about God and the steps and all this, like, weird stuff. And I was like, you guys are so weird, but why are you so happy, you know? And um, they were the really annoying people that would keep calling me when I was drinking. They'd be like, hey, how you doing? I was like, I don't want to talk to you. Like, <laughs> my God, stop calling. But they kept calling, and they kept calling. And um, I'd show up to a meeting here and there, um, and different meetings that I had been attending before. I started talk hearing people talk about the steps and God and stuff like that. And I ran into this woman this one night who just spoke so, like, nothing I've ever heard before in my life. She talked about the spiritual malady. She talked about um, feeling the way I felt my whole life. And she talked about drinking the way I drank. And, like, more importantly, that was what was really important to me. Um, and I talked to her after the meeting, but I was, like, not drunk, so it was, like, really awkward and uncomfortable for me. So I was like, hi. And then, like, I just, like, ran away. Um, and I was just searching for, like, the right combination. Like, maybe if I go to church, like, I can drink successfully. Um, or if I get a boyfriend in AA, like, then I, it'll cancel out me being alcoholic and I can drink okay. Um, and none of those things worked. Um, they're pretty ridiculous options, um, to choose. So now I, I have this boyfriend who's in AA. Um, I'm going to these meetings and I'm not even talking. I'm just kind of sitting there like, why am I here? And I got to this point where it was so, you know, I went out this one night. And it was just it was just like any other night. I drank as much as I could, as fast as I could to get to that point where I like to be at. And um I blacked out, I woke up and I went out with my best friend and her boyfriend and she wasn't there but the boyfriend was there and I was like, Oh my god, how did I get here? What am I doing here? And one of those really annoying people called me and they were like, Hey, um, there's a meeting on campus. Why don't you come check it out? I was like, why would I want to do that? Um, but for some reason, I went. And I was, like, so hungover and so sick and probably just reeked of booze. And I walk into this meeting, and it's, like, three old dudes. I was like, what are you guys even doing in college? <laughs> and me. And um, they, like, went around in, like, in a discussion format, and they complained about their problems or or talked about how much they were like Bill Wilson or whatever. Just crazy stuff. And it got to me, and they're all staring at me. I'm like, oh, my God, I have to talk? Um, but for some reason, I don't know what it was, I just got honest. And I started talking about, like, what was going through my head, like, all this craziness. Um, and I walked out, and I was, like, really honest. The only thing I lied about is, like, I told them I had a few days when I only had, like, a few hours. Um <laughs> But I walked out, and, like, I felt, like, a little bit of weight, like, fall off my shoulders. And I uh, went to that boyfriend who's in AA, and I'm like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm, I'm going to, like, get sober. And he's like, oh, my God, that's so embarrassing. Like, <laughs> I have to date the new girl. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it was all right. And I started running. I started running around AA again. And I'm, uh, I'm looking for the right sponsor that – that fits me, and um, I had that woman's phone number, but, you know, I've heard all this stuff about her, and how she's, like, really tough, and, you know, she questions your motives, and stuff like that, so I was like, ooh, I don't know about that, and I ran around for a little while, and I finally got to a point where, like, I was so desperate, I couldn't stand this boyfriend, I couldn't stand my parents, I couldn't stand my job, I couldn't stand being sober, I couldn't stand drinking anymore, and I finally called this woman, and I asked her for help, um, I asked her if she'd be my sponsor, and she said, absolutely, read the doctor's opinion three times and call me tomorrow. I was like, three times is a little excessive. Um, so I read it twice, and I called her. 
And she, she's like, did you read the doctor's opinion three times? I was like, well, I read it twice. And she was like, read it again and call me back and hung up on me. I was like, how dare she? But I read it again and I called her back. And um, we talked for a little bit and we sat down and uh, we started going through the steps. I was like, this is like, this is like out of control. Like I didn't, I don't know if this is like what I'm supposed to be doing. But um, she didn't ask me about my feelings. She didn't ask me like what was going on, how my day was, you know. She just, we absolutely got to business, and we we started going through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous as they're outlined in the big book, and um, I'm running around with all these happy people, and I'm getting really active. I'm going to all sorts of different meetings, and we're going on commitments, and we're going to rehabs and detoxes, and the psych ward, and all these, you know, and I started, like, seeing it from a different light. I stopped seeing it as, like, a dingy basement with bad coffee. I started seeing, like, light in people's eyes, spreading the message of hope. I couldn't wait to, like, I couldn't wait to do this. Like, I, I got that thirst and this hunger for this program, and I I wrote a fourth step, and I shared a fifth step with this woman, and, um, you know, I, I finally felt like someone else in this world feels like me. Thank God, like, I'm not that crazy. And that was the greatest thing at that time, and I didn't, it wasn't like this big white light experience or like a, you know, an epiphany or anything. I just felt a little bit more okay. And um, like I said, we were really active, and now I'm speaking all. Of, I'm speaking at all these little meetings, and uh, people think people have a lot of opinions. They're like, "You're 90 days sober at a podium. You got to wait for the dust to settle before you do step one." <laughs> And, you know, and, and I'm, like, all revved up. Like, I, I got this fire now, and I'm, like, starting fights at meetings with, like, these old guys who've never done a step in their life, and it was awesome. It was so much fun. And um, I ran into this little girl, and she was so adorable, and I just saw herself dying. I saw her six months ago, like, what I was, like, six months ago, just sitting here, like, looking for something, hoping for something just wanting something, and I just saw it in her eyes, and I talked to her, and I was like, hey, and her name's Liz, and I was like, Liz, just give me a call if you ever want to go to a meeting, and she called me the next day, and I've basically been in and out of that girl's driveway ever since, and um, I was really afraid to do my amends, um, not that I had any real crazy amends to do, it just had to set right all these things, all these people I walked over, all these hearts I just smashed, um, you know, and I didn't really want to do it. It still felt really uncomfortable to me. Um, and this girl asked me to be her sponsor, and I called my sponsor. I was like, I have a sponsor. She's like, you need to do your immense. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Are you excited? Um, but what that girl did is she absolutely, like, got me more active, um, pushed me through the rest of the steps, and I went out, and I made those amends to all those friends that I just, like, walked all over and didn't give – a crap about, you know, just took what I needed, and I started with just a living amends, because there's been plenty of times I've sat down with my parents and said, I'm never going to do this again, I'll, you know, I'll get myself together, so I knew a verbal amends wasn't going to mean anything, so I started, like, picking my weight up around the house and contributing uh, a little bit of my paycheck to them when I could, and, uh, you know, just doing the dishes when the sink was full, that was a big thing for a girl like me, um, <laughs> just stuff like that with my parents, and uh, I started taking this little girl through the steps, and I saw the same fire that was lit under me get lit in her, and um, now uh, we're running around all these states, going to all sorts of conferences, all these meetings, everyone's speaking all over the place, and I got to see people having the same exact experience as I was, and it was absolutely awesome. It was phenomenal. I, I the fire I felt, you know, to see people with genuine smiles who genuinely just want to lay their lives down for other people, people I didn't know just opening their homes to me, like, come stay with us while you're here, and uh, we did a lot of fun stuff, and we saw a lot of great things, and we're up in Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maryland, and Pennsylvania on a Wednesday, I'm like, what are we doing to going here on a Wednesday, um, but it was great, and I had a lot of fun, and, um, I went through the events, and I'm sponsoring this little girl, and now I want to sponsor everyone, you know, because no one's doing it right, so i got to show everyone. So uh, when 
ever, like, I see a new girl, I'm like, I'm your sponsor. Read the, read the doctor's opinion three times and call me, you know? And um, I'm like, everybody needs to look at me and see how many girls I'm sponsoring. Like, I'm doing such an awesome job. Like, don't you see it? I'm great. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, I learned a lot. No, not a lot of those girls stuck around, you know, I'd get them through one, two, and three, and uh, get them to their fourth step and not really ever hear from them again, um, but I couldn't even keep track of most of the time, I couldn't believe it, and the relationship with this A boyfriend's working out, and uh, we're madly in love, and uh, I move out of my parents' house, and we get this apartment, and I'm laying my life down for everyone, because I just want everyone to see, like, how good I am at Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was just crazy. We saw the f craziest things. We did the funnest <laughs> things, um, and, you know, it just, I lost it from the heart. Um, I was doing it just because I wanted you to see how great I was. I wanted you to, I wanted to tell you how many girls I was sponsoring. I wanted to tell you where I was speaking next, um, and, Pretty quickly, like, my life just fell apart. None of these girls are staying sober. The one girl on my couch isn't leaving, and I can't stand to even look at her anymore. <laughs> um, but I'm putting on this persona, like, everything's great. Like, I'm great. AA is great. My life is great. And um, I don't even see it falling apart around me. And, uh... I'm out, I'm down speaking at a different meeting this one night, and I get home, the boyfriend comes home after, and um, he come, he storms in the room, and I walk in, I was like, is everything okay? And he's like, yeah, leave me alone. I'm like, all right, yeah, like, oh, I'm great, like, I'm so peaceful, and I go back into the room, <laughs> and, uh, and I look at him, I'm like, what's going on? Like, talk to me, and he's like... I don't love you, I don't think I ever loved you, and I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. I was like, okay, if, that, if that's what's best for you, then that's what's best for me. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And he storms out, I don't see him for three days, and I uh, finally, like, after crying for, like, 48 straight hours, I finally, like, got my furniture and moved back into my parents' house. And the next week, it's Christmas, and, uh, the next week, I finally got that girl on my couch out. Um, the next week, they walk into the meeting together, and uh, they're dating. And I just, I couldn't believe what was happening around me. I couldn't, you know, I was just, I couldn't even put words to it. It was just a mess. I felt like, A is crap. I'm never going back. Um, everyone's full of it. And um, I hate everyone, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I quit. And uh, the people of Alcoholics Anonymous, those people that were really close to me, my truest friends that have absolutely nothing but love in their hearts, my sponsor, who absolutely laid down her life for me. When, she, when I asked her to be my sponsor, she was in New Jersey for, like, five minutes, and she had no idea where she was going to live. Her job's, like, insane. Um, but she put all that aside and took me through the work, you know. Never even questioned it. Never postponed me or anything like that. Um, she opened her doors to me once again. And, uh, you know, I basically had to be pulled out of bed day in and day out through this time. I can't eat. And um, <laughs> we're, uh, I had this girl from Massachusetts move down. And she was staying with me for a few days. And uh, she's, like, making all these plans and designs like we do when we're new when we're afraid, when, when we're uncomfortable, and um, she just couldn't go anywhere because she had to, like, nurse me, like, she, she had to pull me out of bed and uh, force feed me and all this stuff, and automatically God just started working in my life um, when I was ready to swear off God entirely, when I was ready to quit AA um, and just sit alone by myself, um, God just rearranged everything like he's always done when I'm completely surrendered God just walks in and takes over um and this girl who really had no intentions of staying around 
she was a little bit uncomfortable and didn't feel right, um, took care of me, you know. She was like a month sober, and she's like sitting there talking to me about spiritual principles and God. Um, and we're running around, we're trying to keep busy, and I'm throwing myself on the floor in stores, and I'm cursing people off in the grocery store. <laughs> people are calling me just to ask me, like, who's speaking this weekend, or uh, what, what are the plans for tonight, and I'm cursing them off, and I'm just a disaster. Um, I, can't, I can't believe people still wanted me around. And finally, that sponsor's like, are you ready to look at this from an entirely different perspective and stop being a victim? And I was like, no. <laughs> but, and uh, God had this way of, like, making these plans for me that kept me really busy. And I, um, I finally was at a point where I couldn't stand it anymore. I sat down and I wrote an inventory and I saw it from a different perspective. I saw where my ego was in play, where I was trying to arrange everything. I wanted life to suit me, you know, instead of just being a willing participant and asking God to show me what I should do. I was making some plans and designs like I usually do. And um, it was so hard um, to walk into the home group that me and him, like, worked really hard at. And I'm in the bathroom, like, crying and throwing myself around. But instead... Instead of, like, playing a victim and running from it, I just got more busy. I got more active, and uh, God thought it was best that I traveled the entire East Coast. <laughs> um, and he booked me uh, for, like, eight commitments in the month of January. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, I can't even stand it. Like, I, can't, I don't even want to get out of bed, and I have to go to Florida on vacation. Oh, my God. My life is so hard. Um, don't you people see it? Um, but it, it was just nothing of my doing. And I got on a plane and I went to Florida and I had a great time. I got to be around a lot of people, meet a lot of people having the same experience just like I did when I was in early recovery. Um, and then the day I landed home in Jersey, I get a phone call like, can you speak in Quakertown? And, uh, by the way, we, we're leaving for Maine Tuesday morning. Um, so I'm in a car on the way to Maine. Um, it was just beautiful, and it honestly had nothing to do with me. And um, it was a lot of fun. And slowly but surely, like, that pain started to go away. And I started to really see God in, like, my life and see it in other people. Because the people of Alcoholics Anonymous just laid their lives down for me. When I was a completely unbearable person to be around, they came and they got me every single day and pulled me out of bed and were like, anything you need to do, anything you want to say, just we're here for you, you know? And I've never seen that before in my life. Um, just pure love. And um, it was really fun. I kept really busy. And... I forgot what I was going to say. My mind just went completely blank, but the point I was trying to make is, like, we don't have to be alone anymore. Like, the people of Alcoholics, like, that's the one thing my sponsor said. Like, we don't have to feel this alone, and we have to see it from a different perspective. And um, I know I, at the time I thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Like, how is this happening to me? I've done nothing wrong to any of these people. If anything, I've laid my life down for them. And they should be so grateful for me. <laughs> um, but I know God absolutely took that situation out of my life for a reason. For me, um, he was looking out for what's best for me. Because I don't know what's best for me. I always think I do know what's best for me. But the thing is, I don't. Um, <laughs> And I know God has a bigger plan for me. I know God loves me. I get to see it all the time. And I uh, <laughs> I swore off helping people ever again. Um, I was like, I'm never sponsoring anyone ever again. I'm done. <laughs> just just the 14-year-old because I'm in love with her. Um, <laughs> she's my child. <laughs> you know, and God had this way where these girls were coming up to me. Like, usually I'm the one who's like, I, like, scope them out, you know, who has, like, four days, and I, like, run up to them, and something different started happening. Girls were coming up to me and asking me for help, um, and my phone kept ringing. And just, a, just like, a week ago, um, 
it was our home group, and we had celebrations, and I had to speak, and I really didn't want to. I really didn't want to speak at the home group, and uh, I'm, like, checking the time, like, every, like, five minutes. I was like, I hope, like, this runs out, and I don't have to speak, and there's seven minutes left, and I was like, great, like, how do I speak for seven minutes? I've been, like, I haven't done that in years. (laughs) Like, it's been a year. (laughs) Um, But I get up there, and I, like, spew out some craziness. And I uh, go to a meeting the next night, and then I'm at this the dingy club that I didn't ever want to go to again. And this girl is sitting up in the front, and uh, she sees me walk in, and, like, I just see, like, her, like, face light up. And I'm like, I hope, like, I don't know this girl from somewhere or something, because <laughs> um, I definitely don't know her name. And she's like, Ashley. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> And she's like, I know you don't know me, but I heard you speak on Saturday, and I saw you on Sunday, and I've kind of been stalking you, and, and I really need your help. <laughs> you know? And I got to spend the last few days with her, and um, she's 31 years old. She's married. From the outside, our lives look so different. And I was like, and I used to get in a lot of fear, like, how am I going to help these girls that aren't, like, 14 years old or, like, 20 years old? Um, like, what do I have in common with them? And me and this girl sat down, and we talked for, like, five hours straight, you know. And uh, she's about to go home, and she just starts crying. She's like, Ashley, like, I don't know what happened. Like, I'm 90 days sober, and, and just I'm white-knuckling it. And I was planning on drinking that night. You walked into the club. Um, but I, I just know that, like, God just rearranged everything, and he put you in my life. And I'm just so glad, and I'm so willing to do whatever it is you want me to do so I can have the same experience that you're having. And um, it's just, it's such a beautiful thing to see someone get it, to see someone want it, to see someone, like, willing to go to any length. Because I went, you know, I went to any length to get this. Um, what time is it? I don't see a clock. Five up, all right. Oh, <laughs> she's pointing over there. I couldn't see. Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> and, like, where the point where I was sworn off, like, I'm never going to help anyone ever again. Like, if I just ran with the fear and I didn't walk through it and I um, was just completely self-centered, like my core is, because that's my only problem. You know, I think I have all these problems in the world and all these people really wronged me. Um My only problem is that I'm extremely selfish. And um, she's she's like, how do you do it? Like, how how do you get happiness? How are you okay? Like, I shared my experience with her about the whole situation. She's like, how are you still here? I was like, it's this. It's these experiences right here. People just inconveniencing themselves a little bit to make sure someone else in this world is okay. And it's that simple, and it's just helping others is, like, the bright spot of my life. And thank you so much for inviting me out here to speak. Um, It's always a privilege and an honor. Thank you so much, Sam Reed, for making me so nervous. (laughs) Um, I can't wait till my website's uploaded. (laughs) Thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.